Welcome to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kurt Wohler, talking with experts in functional and integrative health and medicine, discussing critical information for improving your health and wellness to help you live a long, full life. Let's get to it. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kurt Wohler. And we're going to have a discussion today about the microbiome and specifically something called the microbiota transfer therapy. I'm joined today by a Dr. James Adams. Dr. Adams is at Arizona State University. He heads up the Autism and Asperger's Research Program, and he has well published on this topic. So we're going to have an interesting conversation. So James, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Kurt. So before we get into the meat of this topic, just give a, a bit of an overview of your experience, your background, how you got interested in this topic, and then we'll talk about this very important uh, information. Sure. So um, I have a daughter with autism, and that was what motivated me over 20 years ago um, to begin looking at research into autism. Uh, so frustrating that we didn't know how to diagnose it medically uh, for medical tests. We didn't know very much about treatment didn't know very much about how to prevent it. So we've done a lot of research since then, uh, making good progress in all of those areas. Um, and so a lot of our work is focused on nutrition. So we've developed vitamin and mineral supplements for children with autism. After doing five studies of it, we've now uh, formed a nonprofit that distributes our vitamin and mineral supplement all around the world. Uh, we also have been doing a lot of work on microbiota transplant. And so in order to continue funding that work, to get it to FDA approval, we formed a company a couple of years ago, and we're now over 45 families have joined us as investors. We're halfway towards our goal. And so that is helping us with um, moving ahead with getting microbiota transplant approved for autism. Now, you had written a, a, some recent articles. Uh, one publication was in 2017. And then the latest one I saw was in 2019 called Long-Term Benefit of Microbiota Transfer Therapy. And one of the questions that comes up, because sometimes people will say, well, it's fecal microbiome transplant. And then there's this term now, microbiota transfer therapy. Is there a difference between the two? And if there is, what uh, can you maybe describe what the differences are? Yeah, there's a substantial difference that... Um, originally, fecal transplant was done with just raw human stool, about a third of which is gut bacteria. And that was found to be very effective for treating people with a bad infection called C. difficile. And C. difficile is a very nasty infection that causes life-threatening diarrhea, affects about up to half a million Americans a year, kills of order 20,000 people a year. Um, but amazingly, just one dose of raw stool taken through a colonoscopy or through an enema, or through a nasal gastric tube in the stomach, just one to two doses cures C. diff within a few days. So it's just miraculous for C. diff. For autism, it turns out it's much, much harder to treat. And so our colleague, uh, uh, Thomas Barodi, a gastroenterologist in Australia, treated the first uh, seven uh, young uh, teens with autism. And he is, um, he treated them not once, but he had to treat them every day for three months and slowly, gradually saw improvements in GI symptoms and surprisingly also saw improvements in autism symptoms. And so that was when we decided to, with his advice and help, we did our first trial, which you mentioned. And that trial, we found that um, we pre treated with vancomycin powerful antibiotic to kill off harmful bacteria. Then we used a bowel cleanse to remove remaining bacteria. And then we went ahead and did microbiota transplant, high dose for a couple of days, and then maintenance dose for eight weeks. So unlike C. diff, the changes didn't occur right away. It occurred slowly and gradually over about five weeks. And finally, by 10 weeks into treatment, 80% of the GI symptoms were gone and um, roughly 25% decrease in autism symptoms, which is very substantial. 
Again, this is an open label study. That's the main reason why we differentiate the term. We coined the term microbiota transplant therapy because it's much more intensive. It's not just one dose it's used for C. diff. It's pre-treatment with ANCO and a bottle cleanse, and then eight. We're now actually using 12 weeks. We've used up to 16 weeks of treatment for adults. So in the second paper, I know that you had, what, 18 kids that you went back and reevaluated. Now, that was two years later after that original study. And what was remarkable to me, and I realized that the sample size was not huge, but still significant numbers, 47% decrease in ASD or autism spectrum disorder severity. Um, I, I believe it was 83% to a, a drop of 17% with regards to, uh, to what would be considered severe autism. And then what about 44%, I believe it was, you didn't even have any of the criteria for autism, I guess, after that, or uh, I might, might have been reading that incorrectly, but a really big shift. I mean, these are the types of numbers that are difficult to get in, in many cases with other types of biomedical therapy. You know, we can see benefits, obviously, with dietary intervention and nutritional supplementation and other types of things. But for the length of time, is what's impressive to me in how long the benefits have lasted. Um, can you speak to that, you know, that, that insight you had with those particular kids? Um, and and what, what do you think is happening? I mean, that's allowing for the gut of these kids to be persistently better for this long a period of time, whereas we're getting other kids that seem to be regressing much more quickly. Yeah. So it was a surprise to us how much benefit we found very happy surprise that um, at the end of our study, uh, our first study, we then stopped and waited eight weeks to see if the benefits were continuing. Because a previous study with vancomycin alone showed that vancomycin alone for eight weeks resulted in great improvements in gut symptoms, great improvements in autism symptoms. But then when treatment was stopped, within a few weeks, the benefits were lost in almost every. So we knew that vancomycin was great at killing off harmful bacteria, but then they would just regrow. So the approach we use with microbiota transplant therapy, we first use the vanco to kill off the harmful bacteria. Unfortunately, it kills some good bacteria as well. But then using a bowel cleanse to remove most of the remaining bacteria, and then going ahead and doing the microbiota transplant allowed us to replace those bacteria um, the original bacteria with bacteria from super healthy adults. With C. diff, it doesn't matter too much who the donor is. Almost anyone can be an effective donor for C. diff. For autism, it matters a lot. So our colleagues at the University of Minnesota picked the very healthiest people, the top few percent of people, 95% of Americans would not qualify. So we used very, very healthy super donors. But then we um, were thrilled that eight weeks after stopping treatment, we had very good results. The benefits were all holding or continuing to improve. Initially, the kids with autism had about 25% fewer species of bacteria. By the end of treatment, they had a normal level. So we were able to restore a normal amount. A normal, a typical person, healthy person, has about 500 species of bacteria, depending on how you count them. But a year after we finished that study, we thought we were done. We published it. Then three different fa autism families came up to me at meetings and said, Professor Adams, by the way, my son's doing better than ever. So the third time, I finally listened, and we did what we had not planned to do, uh, that follow-up study. So we followed up with every one of the 18 families who had been in the original study. Our expert autism evaluator, who's evaluated hundreds of families, evaluated them. And to her surprise, she said yes. 47% decrease in autism symptoms from baseline. There's some um, placebo effect, but the evaluation tool we use tends to be very resistant to placebo effect. Um, we found at the start of the study, over 80% were severe. By the end of our study, less than 20% were severe, 40% mild autism, mild to moderate, and 45% below the cutoff for they still had some symptoms, but they did not meet the criteria for either mild autism. 
what the parents told us was really interesting. They said, um, it just seemed that their child was better able to learn, better able to learn language, better able to learn behavior and social interactions. And so slowly, gradually, they began catching up to their peers. Most importantly, what the parents said is that the child just seemed happier. That getting rid of the gut symptoms, the gut pain, we think was a big factor. But also now we know a lot more about the bad gut bacteria and many of the toxins they produce that affect many parts of the body. So we've learned a lot from them. But yes, that first study was very dramatic. You know, one of the things I've seen over the years, I do a lot of organic acid testing. I do quite a bit of stool testing as well. We see a lot of these organic compounds, particularly from the Clostridium species, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, Clostridium difficile, not necessarily causing bowel disease per se, because some of the many of the tests come back normal for the toxin A and B on stool testing, but they've got for cresol or you know a few of those other organic acids, and we know that the main effect at least appears to be within the, the nervous system. So I've seen a lot of behavioral issues over the years. A lot of times, self-injurious behavior, aggressive behavior, not always, but uh, there goes that sort of gut brain, you know, brain gut connection, which is so well known and established now, I, I would say, certainly confirmed or at least um, highly regarded. One of the things that struck me in your paper too was the effect uh, seeing low levels of bifidobacterium. And I see this quite a bit on stool testing. And as the more we read about environmental factors, different environmental chemicals and other things affecting the microbiome. Do you know anything about that bacteria or th th that group, why it seems to be so susceptible to depletion? Because it's, we're seeing this in other areas too. Yeah. So back in our, our earlier study we did back in 2011, we um, did a study and it was the first one uh, to look at a correlation of gut symptoms with autism symptoms. And we were shocked. We found a very strong correlation. The kids who had um, worse gut problems also had much worse autism symptoms. And so that was very dramatic. And we know from the medical history study we did, you know, as a physician, you know, the first thing you do is you take a medical history of your patient. For researchers, it's often the last thing that people do. And so our study in 2017 was the first one I know of where we asked the simple question, when did the gut symptoms begin? Every one of our 18 uh, participants in our first study said those gut symptoms began in infancy. In our adult study that we just finished, and these are adults who were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 90% of them said their gut symptoms began in infancy. So we think that's really key, along with the fact that we did a study with Caltech, where we took gut bacteria from typical kids and from kids with autism, put it into mice, and those mice had offspring, then the offspring who'd received microbiota transplant from kids with autism, they developed autistic symptoms in the animals. So we think that these gut infections occur either during pregnancy or early infancy, because we also found there was a lot of uh, uh, increased use of antibiotics and also increased use of C-section. So the reason I bring that up is that another key factor we found was um, decreased duration of breastfeeding in the kids with autism with gut problems versus typical kids and increased C-section. And what people sometimes forget is when a woman has a C-section, they're also giving antibiotics right then for the surgery they've just had. And those antibiotics passed into the infant through their breast milk. So the bottom line, sorry to give a long answer to your question, but it's a very powerful question. Why is bifido low? And um, one of the main reasons we think is that um, the widespread use of antibiotics and better hygiene has decreased bifido, especially the infantis, the bacteria that's named after the human infant and some yeah. of its cousins. That makes sense. And that yeah. yeah, and that bacteria I think you know is so special because it's one of the few that can consume mother's breast milk. And so nowadays most infants um, and most uh, women 
are not carriers of the infantis anymore. And that's why we strongly advocate for starting uh, B. infantis probiotics for breastfed infants the first few days of life. I came from the generation where my mom was convinced, as many moms of that generation, to uh, formula was better. You don't need to bre- you don't need to breastfeed. Whereas, fortunately, with our kids, you know, uh, my wife bre- breastfed them, you know, for uh, for quite a while. So very interesting. I figure the antibiotics would play a role, whether it was to the child or to the mom. You know, the, the C-section certainly makes sense, not getting that implantation of bacteria. Um, and then we have the environmental factors. You know, I mean, that could be its own discussion, just some of the pesticides, herbicides yeah. that are sprayed on food. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting because it's, it's one of those things you commonly see depleted, and it, it plays a big deal, obviously, with regards to overall gut health. One of the other things you mentioned in this 2000, excuse me, 2019 paper was Provotella um, and other bacteria that were, I think, were in, were improved after the transfer therapy. And some of these bacteria have a particular effect on butyric acid production, which we know is very helpful for the intestinal tract, particularly the large bowel. But it also has an influence on improving mitochondrial function. And that has been looked at you know, I think fairly extensively in autism in just upregulating mitochondrial activity. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Because, I, you know, we're, we're talking about the microbiome, but the, the impacts go beyond just the gut and the brain. It's, it's throughout our entire body, even things at the cellular level with regards to cellular metabolism. Yeah. So I, as you say, I think butyrate is a key issue. I think the reason why gut problems, the main reason why gut problems are so widespread in the U.S. and also in autism is just low fiber consumption, that certain gut bacteria, a subset of gut bacteria, consume dietary fiber and convert it into butyrate and other substances. And butyrate, as you know, is the main nutrient for the cells that line the gut that provides 60 to 70 percent of the energy. So the average woman consumes, in the U.S., consumes only half the recommended amount of fiber. The average man is even worse, consume only a third the amount of recommended fiber. And that means then there's less fiber to be converted into butyrate. The bottom line is most Americans, their guts are starved for butyrate because they're not getting enough fiber from whole fruit, whole vegetables. And so that's why they're at much greater risk for a wide range of GI problems, just because their guts are very unhealthy, the cells adjust starving. And when we did our survey of mothers of kids with autism who had gut issues, we found that the one difference in their diet, the only difference in their diet of the mums of the typical kids versus the autism mums was lower fiber consumption, less consumption of whole fruits, whole vegetables. And also we found that in the kids with autism, eating similar diets to their mums, they again had lower fiber Unfortunately, giving fiber back in doesn't seem to help too much, at least in our experience. You may have a different experience. But I think once the damage is done, going back to high fiber only has a limited help. And I'm skeptical of many fiber supplements. There are studies that just single source fiber supplements can even worsen gut problems. Whereas what we think people really need is a diversity of types of fiber, the same way you get from a diversity of whole fruits and vegetables. Now, coming back to your point about butyrate um, and the importance of it to mitochondria, yeah, Richard Fry did a great study. Um, He's, you know, really our expert in mitochondrial issues of autism and using live cell cultures, he was able to show that butyrate could improve mitochondrial function. And we now know that Paracresol, and I've been talking about earlier, paracresol is one of many different toxins that gut bacteria make. And we know that paracresol, there are 17 studies showing it's elevated in kids with autism. Not every stud, not every child with autism, but about a quarter to a third of them have elevated paracresol, and that poisons um, the mitochondria. It causes many other problems too. So I think a lot of the mitochondrial issues. I would perhaps even guess most of them, but I'll at least say many of the problems are due to um, uh, bad gut bacteria. And we did also a study 
it, pause me if you want. But no, I, you're good. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I have a few thoughts, but go ahead. Keep going. I'll wait for you to. Right. Yeah. So we did a study also for kids with Pitt Hopkins syndrome. Pitt Hopkins uh, kids are extremely severe. It's a single gene disorder. They have extremely severe autism symptoms, extremely severe um, physical symptoms. They basically can't walk. They can't talk. They have an IQ of about a one-year-old, and they have even worse gut problems than kids with autism. Very bad constipation, lifelong. Some of them have even died from it. So we did a, a treatment study for them with their microbiota transplant, and we saw great improvements, great reductions in pain, uh, great improvements in uh, GI symptoms, and some improvements in general at Hopkins symptoms. Again, it's a single gene disorder, so we can only do so much. But what was re really interesting is we suspected these kids because they're so physically impaired. Again, they're mostly in wheelchairs. They have very weak muscle control. We suspected a mitochondrial problem. Sure enough, we tested them. They all had bad, uh, badly impaired mitochondrial functioning, and MTT was able to substantially improve it about halfway towards normal. So it didn't cure it but it substantially improved their function. And the, part of the reason we suspect, and this is a more hypothesis, but we know that the mitochondria are a unique cell in our body because they're the only ones that have their own DNA. So we suspect that historically, they were probably a bacteria that joined our body. And so perhaps that's why they're especially susceptible to toxins like paracresol, because paracresol is an antibiotic. It's excreted by bad bacteria to kill off the good ones so it can stay there and survive. So in the same way it can poison other bacteria, mitochondria are in many ways uh, historically bacteria, one could say. It's maybe a bit of a stretch, but that's our hypothesis. I love that connection. Uh, in fact, I have a paper that talks about that particular compound, uh, P. Cresol. I call it Cresol. So, uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, paracresol, it's also for cresol. So the, the, uh, the, the same compound we see on the organic acid test, I have a paper that shows that it inhibits other types of clostridium bacteria, which not all clostridium is pathogenic, right? A lot of our microbiome right. is clostridium that are very beneficial. So we have some right. really bad characters within that grouping, C. difficile, of course, but very interesting. I, that makes sense. That makes that, that makes sense to me with regards to the bacteria, the connection from an evolutionary biology standpoint, going back to bacteria with regards to mitochondria. I do know that uh, forcresol or paracresol also has some negative effects in the brain, I believe on synaptic function as well. I've, I've got to look at that a little bit deeper. I know Dr. Bill Shaw, who uh, started Great Plains Lab, had recently wrote a paper on HPHBA, another compound, and there was a mention about for cresol on uh, synaptogenesis, I believe. But we know that it's also yeah, a major inhibitor a of, of... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we're writing a review paper on uh, paracresol right now. So some of the things I can say is, yes, it dramatically affects neurotransmitter function. It blocks the conversion of dopamine right. to norepinephrine. And so you get high amounts of dopamine, low amounts of norepinephrine and epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. So it's one of the big problems. But also it inhibits dendrite growth, which is how neurons connect to one another. And so it also um, is inflammatory and so causes a variety of inflammatory reactions throughout the body, including neuroinflammation. So it affects the brain in a number of nasty ways. And again, it's just one of... 60 some metabolites that we've identified made by bacteria and yeast. I don't want to, we don't want to forget about yeast. So at some point we should talk about that oh, too. Um, yeah. Real quickly, I was going to mention about the, the diet. And I want to come back to this before we, we end, but a number of years ago, I was actually at my state, um, my state profession, my, my osteopathic physicians association conference. And amazingly, there was a whole day on the microbiome. So they talked about the gut, the microbiome of the mouth, the microbiome of the skin. And I remember a slide that this nutritionist put up. She did a great two-hour lecture on the microbiome, talked about 
and I can't ever, could never find the study, but I do remember the slide. The thing that had the greatest impact on the microbiome was diet. And what she advocated for was the consistent consumption between 12 to 15 plant-based foods per day to help provide a diversity of nutrients for the microbiome, kind of what you get maybe from a more Mediterranean diet, which is sort of my overall preference. So the lecture ends and we all walk out because it's lunchtime. And there's this beautiful buffet of all kinds of plant-based foods. And so I totally agree with you, right? The, the single supplement approach, you know, when you're trying to reestablish normalcy in these areas, particularly something as complex and diverse as the gut, you can't just rely on a supplement or a fiber source. It's those things complement a healthy diet. So really both things need to be approached. And so I appreciate you bringing that up because that's, that's absolutely true in my, in my experience. To your other point, we know that in autism, many of these kids clearly have gut problems. We see a lot of bacterial dysbiosis, including the clostridium species, and the negative impacts, like you mentioned, on dopamine beta hydroxylase. Fungus is another one. And so I, I don't know, and maybe you have, have you looked specifically at different fungal types of species and the impact that that has. And, and, and I'm assuming it is, James, but the, the microbiota transfer therapy, I'm, gonna, I'm assuming would also just perhaps reestablish some normalcy in uh, diminishing fungal overgrowth or proliferation as well. Yeah. So lots of questions there. You can say a lot about it. So um, in our study back in 2011, when we looked at gut bacteria, we also looked at yeast. And we did find that a subset of kids with autism, about 25%, had increased um, yeast on stool culture compared to a much smaller percentage um, in the typical kids. It wasn't quite statistically significant, but it was close. Since then, one of the things we found, we need to get around to publishing this, is that the kids with autism who had yeast infections also had much worse autism symptoms, but not worse GI symptoms. And so we think of yeast as a hidden gut infection, that the only way you'll know about it is through doing a test for it. I like the culture tests. Um, there have now been half a dozen studies, some by our group, showing that up to about half of kids with autism some studies even say more, but about half of kids with autism with elevated levels of yeast, much higher than, and every study has shown much higher than that, the typical kids. And our study is the only one that looked at correlations with symptoms, and we found this correlation with gut, with neurological symptoms, but not autism, but not GI symptoms. One of the key things we learned about yeast is back in our 2011 study, we also looked at the body's main defense against yeast, which is secretory IgA. So it's the type of IgA, the type of antibody secreted into the gut, with the main defense against yeast and bacteria in the gut. What we discovered is that the kids with autism who had yeast infections had very low secretory IgA. And much later, we learned that yeast actually produces enzymes, proteases, to destroy secretory IgA. So yeast have evolved over many thousands of years, and the, these particular yeast, like C. albicans, can then, once they're established in a colony, they can then produce these proteases to keep the secretory IgA down. So we don't know if it's the low secretory IgA caused the yeast infection, or the yeast infection caused the low secretory IgA. But regardless, once you have that yeast infection, it means it's probably going to last for years, perhaps even decades, hidden. The only thing you know is it has worse autism symptoms. So in a kid with autism, you don't know to look for it. So the, the key recommendation I would give to everyone on this show is to do a test for yeast, the culture test, doctor's data or other labs that offer it. And the great thing is that then those labs will also do 
a sensitivity test to tell you what antifungal prescription or herbal to use. But without checking, our estimate is about half of kids with autism have their brains poisoned by toxins from yeast. And a simple example of a toxin that yeast make is alcohol. And so it's so obvious that these alcohols produce, um, uh, that have a major function effect on brain function. But that's a, a minor toxin. We've since discovered that there are nastier toxins like beta carbolins that are produced by yeast. And a very similar compound, if you get it, you, it causes Parkinson's disease. And we know that there are reports that up to 30% of autism adults develop Parkinson's disease early in life, um, early in adulthood. And what's that, what, was that, what was that particular toxin again? Beta carboline. Beta yeah, carboline. Beta carboline. Yeah, it's something that we've seen in our research studies. And again, we're very concerned about it because we think it is affecting, but we know it has some very toxic effects. Um, interesting. One of the, well, I've got a couple of questions for you. One, uh, have you looked at mold colonization, aspergillus, for example, which we tend to pick up quite a bit on the testing that we do? Um, that's a whole other discussion, right? Because of the toxins that it can produce. And then you've got the immunological reactivity and the cross reactivity types of things that can occur. So first off, have you looked at mold colonization? I, and then I'll follow up with a second question. Yeah. So we haven't looked at, we have looked in our most recent study at a variety of fungi. Um, and I can't talk about those results. They're, in, um, they're being submitted for publication now. But I will say certainly they're a major concern to us as well as general yeast. Um, I think the key issue again is that, um, as I said, that you can wipe them out with um, antifungals. I was so struck many years ago by the Autism Research Institute when they surveyed 23,000 families to see what were the most effective treatments for autism. The two most effective treatments of any type of any supplement were two antifungals, diflucan and nystatin. But what I've heard from many physicians, I'll let you confirm this, is that they help temporarily, but unless you go on a very restricted diet to restrict carbs and sugars, then they just keep on coming back. And I think this low secretory IgA explains why. It seems to take quite a while for the body to recover from these yeast infections. And that's very true. A couple things. One, just an observation I've seen, and then a question for you, and then if I can remember, I'll have another question. But acetaldehyde, we know is a byproduct of ethanol metabolism. And yeah. it's a methylation inhibitor. In fact, I learned that by Richard, uh, Richard Deeth's research on the methylation imbalances in autism. And I've seen that play out. In fact, when we used to do a lot of methylation support supplementation or methylcobalamin, for example, I get these kids that wouldn't respond even though they should, or you think they would. Um, and it mm -hmm. wasn't until you actually lowered, maybe not completely cleared, their underlying fungal issue, that all of a sudden the methylation support would start going up. I didn't really understand why until I understood the mechanism. And there's obviously other toxicities to acetaldehyde. Um, the other thing was I have seen over the years that, and I, I teach about this, and that is, is don't, don't assume that all of the behavior issues in an autism child is candida related. You know, if they have the goofiness, the giddiness, the silliness, the inappropriate laughter, because I've been bitten when I thought, well, I'm just gonna give nice dad, right? I, I, we're good to go. And all of a sudden you get a complete 180 where they become aggressive, sometimes self-injurious. I had one case where within three days, a child went from being goofy, giddy, silly to the parent calling me up in a panic because he was headbanging against the wall. And that to me was like, well, that's more of a clostridium problem I've seen. And in that particular case, I didn't have time to do a test. I stopped the antifungal, I put him on an antibiotic and it dis the behavior disappeared in 48 hours. So it's not like that dramatic all the time, but I've often wondered what is the competitive relationship between 
these organisms. Obviously, we know that, like you said before, the, the P. cresol, for example, gets secreted by certain types of clostridium to inhibit other bacteria. I'm wondering if it's doing it against competing candida, because if you just throw, if you have a kid with clostridium problems and you throw a nice statin at them, sometimes you'll see the clostridium situation get worse. So we know that antibiotics, on the other hand, obviously increase yeast symptoms, but do you, do you know of some other relationship mechanistically that's happening with these competing think, organisms? Yeah, I think there's certainly a general competition for food in the gut. Certainly with antibiotics, you increase the risk of fungal infections. Um, fungi normally present in only minimal amounts in the gut, um, but if they were present at a very high level and you wipe them out, I guess it's conceivable you could cause a bacterial overgrowth. Um, but the exact mechanism for that, I wouldn't know offhand. Um, interestingly, um, we did find that in our microbiota transplant study um, for Pitt Hopkins, where most of the kids with Pitt Hopkins had both clostridial infections and yeast infections. When we treated them with MTT, we wiped out the bad clostridia. We also wiped out all of the yeast as well. Um, so that was very effective to see. We're looking at that now in our um, uh, autism studies. We've been limited by funding. Four times we've asked the federal government for funding to look at yeast and fungi in autism. And four times they've said no. <laughs> so it's very frustrating. Um, but we, we've now raised some extra money from our company. Um, we're trying to raise more so we can look to more looking more at yeast now. So we have a new paper coming out on that that I think is going to shed some important light into yeast and fungi in autism. Excellent. The, in the paper, you, this latest, well, the one paper back, it's not real recent, the one in 2019, this long-term benefit of MTT in autism, but you, you talk about mucin layer. And I wonder if it's more than just secretory IgA, because obviously secretory IgA gets secreted onto the mucosal layer, but you've got that mucin layer that, that if for people who are listening, maybe don't know the science, this buffer essentially. And mm -hmm. you mentioned a, there's a specific type of bacteria. And there's a number of bacteria that are known to improve the mucin layer, like acromantia, for example. I always have a hard time pronouncing the, the, pronouncing the name of this one, the, Desulfuro, uh, vibrio, I think it is. I believe that one has an effect on the mucin layer. So do you feel or maybe know if the microbiota transfer therapy is somehow either directly having an accentuating effect on the mucin layer or just maybe bringing in more bacteria that are known to enhance it? Yeah, the... The fair answer is we don't know for sure about affecting the mucin layer because we're not measuring that. That would involve doing uh, colonoscopies or endoscopies, and we're just not that invasive in our studies. Um, but I think, yes, it's very likely that we are substantially uh, improving the mucin layer. So I think that's a fair hypothesis, but I, I can't say for sure that what is going on. But one thing we haven't really touched on yet that I think is really important in understanding the whole gut microbiome is understanding what's the major nutritional deficiency in autism. And the major nutritional deficiency in autism by far is sulfate. And that many studies by Rosemary Waring and Al, our team have shown that about 90% of kids with autism have low sulfate. A standard test for that is you give a toxin like acetaminophen, the active ingredient in Tylenol. And it takes kids with autism much longer to deal with that toxin because they have low amounts of sulfate in their blood and they excrete high amounts in their urine. So I've been, I was puzzled for 20 years since Rosemary's work came out. Why are kids with autism excreting so much sulfate in their urine? Why are they so low and I always assumed it was because the kidneys were broken. But now we have a totally different understanding. The main, one of the major roles of sulfate is to detoxify toxins like paracresol. So paracresol is not soluble. So paracresol, in order to be excreted from the body, 
the body first needs to sulfate it in order to then make it soluble in the blood and the urine so it can then be excreted. So whereas I first thought that kids with autism are low in sulfate and their sulfate system wasn't working well, actually it seems in most cases the sulfation system is working over time. There are so many bacterial yeast toxins being produced that need to be sulfated to get rid of from the body. That's why sulfate levels are so low, and that's why in the body, and why the levels are so high in the urine. So the bottom line is that I think one of the main things that families can do to help deal with the symptoms of these infections is to take extra sulfate and the two best ways are either through an Epsom salt bath or through MSM. And that's why our vitamin mineral supplement includes MSM. And that's why our study is the only one I know of that shows we can improve sulfation in kids with autism because of both the MSM and the many other vitamins and minerals help with meth, with um, sulfation system. Interesting. What, what do you make of parents who talk about their kids' have hyperactivity reactions to some sulfating supplementation, even the Epsom salts sometimes, not commonly. Um, Interesting question. I haven't heard that. Um, and so I wouldn't have a direct response. I mean, Epsom salts are just magnesium and sulfate. And through a warm bath, um, my colleague, Tapan Aja, has shown, hasn't published it, but he's measured blood levels in kids with autism before and after Epsom salt baths, sometimes it's very effective. Um, it could be they just, as with any supplement, you need to go gradually. So maybe start at right. a little shorter time and go up. But I'd be very surprised if magnesium sulfate was a problem in, in the vast majority of cases. One of the things I, I know is oxalate uh, appears to have an impact on on sulfation chemistry to some degree. Maybe this may be something that Julie Matthews, who you and I have worked with now for quite a while and her work on nutrition uh, might be able to answer. Um, it's my understanding is that uh, oxalate can be, can deplete sulfate because of, of the, the, the transporting mechanism that occurs within the gut as well as the kidneys. I don't know if you've heard of that or not, or know of any information. We certainly know a lot of these Autistic kids have tend to have high oxalic acid, whether it's coming through because of enteric hypooxaluria from or fat digestion or yeast production. Um, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I haven't followed the oxalate literature as much. So all I can say is that sulfation is a major detoxification pathway. It's not the only one, but for some substances like paracresol. 95% of it is sulfated to be excreted. A small amount, it goes through glucuronidation, a few percent. Um, but that's pretty much the only way to get rid of it. Um, and so for a number of the, uh, of the other closer related toxins made by gut bacteria, in some yeast, sulfation is very important. So in your experience through all the research you've done over the years and the different papers you've written, because you've written some great papers on vitamins and, and, and other nutrients. You just have done some work with Julie Matthews on different diets and linked to different types of behaviors. In fact, I used that webinar that you two did quite a bit um, just as a information for parents to say, hey, here's some things to consider. Where would you rank the MTT, the, the microbiome? Uh, transfer therapy in its effectiveness overall and sort of the core autism behaviors or characteristics that you've seen over the years when you compare it to some of the other studies you've done? Yeah, so our um, CARS evaluator who uh, reviewed some of our studies, it was did the evaluations for our studies for both uh, nutrition and MTT. Yes, we saw good improvements with our vitamin mineral supplement but we've seen even more with microbiota transplant. I think microbiota transplant is getting at one of the really core issues. Again, we now think we have good evidence that now about 95% of kids with autism have either bacterial and or fungal um, yeast infections in their gut. Uh, we see high levels of toxic metabolites, much higher than that of typical kids. 
I mean, sometimes these levels are 10 to 100 times higher, uh, even more. Um, and so I think that's it's a, a central issue. I think it's one of the core issues in autism. And we know that the gut bacteria from kids with autism, if you put it into an animal, it causes autistic symptoms in the animal. So I think that's very powerful. Um, so my impression is that it's one of the most uh, potent treatments out there. In our study for adults with autism, who had had symptoms for decades, on average with our best therapy, we're still figuring out what is the optimal dosing. On average, we went from severe autism down to mild, down to moderate autism by the end of treatment. And by the end of um, 18 month follow-up, they were down to mild autism on average. And we think we may be under dosing. So we still have, we're now working on doing a dosing study to see if we can optimize dosing even more. So I have very high hopes for microbiota transplant, but we've got to raise the money for our company to um, go ahead and do our next round of studies. Right now in the United States, the FDA you know, has tight regulations over this therapy, particularly for C. difficile infections. And that would be sort of the classic bowel disease scenario. Can you speak a little bit about the the current standing, where you see things perhaps going or hopefully will going uh, through your work with regards to the FDA and access to this intervention? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to look back at veterinarians who for many decades have been treating uh, horses with fecal transplant for colitis in young colts. And with humans, we were much slower to begin doing that, but began doing it for C. diff, and it's just been miraculous. Um, and so many uh, research, many studies, many reports by physicians that it was very helpful for C. diff. But then the FDA decided that like human blood, there is some risk of infection. And therefore they decided to classify it as a drug and require that it go through rigorous FDA safety testing. So there have been tens of thousands of people treated with um, fecal transplant for C. diff and it's been uh, very effective, about 90% cure rate within a few days after one to two doses. But unfortunately, there have been a few cases of serious illnesses or even a few deaths when people caught an infection, which wasn't tested for. And that's why the FDA has, um, that's I think appropriate why the FDA is cautious. So we are, we use very rigorous testing the group we work with at University of Minnesota has treated over a thousand people with zero serious adverse effects. We've treated over a hundred people with autism with zero serious adverse effects. So now that we know what to treat, it's very safe. It's really only in people who have severely compromised immune systems, people who are taking, um, for example, immune suppressants because they just had a bone marrow transplant. When your immune system is completely suppressed, then you have to be extra cautious. But again, that's one of the things you screen for in the recipient, making sure the recipient doesn't have a severely compromised immune system. But in general, I think um, now the FDA has approved um, two medications for C people with C. diff infections. Again, a C. diff infection needs to be proven by a high level of toxin in the blood. That's the gold standard. So just not a small amount in stool because everyone, almost everyone has a small amount of C. diff in the stool. It's when it gets to really high amounts and they can measure the amount of the blood. That's what it's been approved for. So there's a lot of information out in the internet, right? That people are accessing with regards to this therapy or information or parents are trying to access. Are there things that you would encourage against when it comes to attempting to do some of this stuff on your own, people who are, you know, what, what's your, um, uh, any recommendations or words of, 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 of caution or wisdom that you could give other uh, parents out there when they start looking at this information? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that um, a third of stool is bacteria. And those bacteria, um, a healthy, there have been studies, cases where people who, and seemingly healthy donors have transferred their gut bacteria to recipients who had a compromised immune system 
and those people became very sick and in a few cases died. Again, this is out of tens of thousands of cases, so it's rare, but it's not zero. The American Gastroenterological Association has a rigorous set of standards which we follow and go beyond in evaluating our donors. But the real issue, I think, is that not everyone, almost anyone is a good donor for C. diff. For autism, we've seen big differences in donors. So the special criteria we use to make sure we get the very healthiest top few percent, I think is very important. And so we're continuing to do research on who is the healthiest donor, what type of gut vector are most important to be present in the donor. And um, so there is some risk. We definitely don't recommend doing it at home on your own. Again, it's illegal to do that. Um, under for, It's illegal for a physician to help a family do that uh, because it's not approved by the FDA. Um, so I have to be very clear. Our studies are investigational. We're working towards getting approval by the FDA. We're working very hard, but we're not there yet. That's why we're open to more families investing in our company. Help us give us the money so we can move faster towards FDA approval. So let's talk about your different websites you have, companies, and where can parents contact you, follow your work? What's the best way? Yeah. So for general information, going to our ASU website, which is just autism.asu.edu, is probably the best way for general information on our research. For information on our um, uh, company that's doing microbiota transplant, funding that, we're open to investors. Um, for investors, it, the website is gut, brain, axis, A-X-I-S, therapeutics.com. If that's too hard to find, you can, again, just go to our ASU website. It'll link to there. And also from our ASU website, it'll link to our nonprofit vitamin mineral supplement company. And that's uh, Autism NRC for Nutrition Research Center, autismnrc.org. Excellent. Any final uh, thoughts? Uh, any final topics perhaps we didn't cover that you want to mention? Uh, you know, anything, you know, before we wrap things up? I think the key thing to, to recommend to families is, is that to prevent these gut problems, a high fiber diet, high whole fruits, whole vegetables, I think is key. But to treat these issues, again, we think roughly half of kids and adults with autism have yeast infections that are very persistent and can last for decades. And the only way to know is to do a um, a stool test to see if those toxins are present. So I highly recommend families to do that. That's something simple and safe you can do now. Microbiota transplant working very hard on, but it's still a few years away except for our research studies. Excellent information. You know, James, I want to thank you for all the work you've done over the years. Uh, I've known about your work. I mean, our, our days in the early defeat autism now go back many, many years. Um, uh, I, I think before we came on, I was like, have we ever actually crossed paths before physically? But I certainly have followed your work. I've, I've read many of your papers. And so, um, uh, you know, it's what you provide is incredibly important and, and very detailed. And And Kurt, thank you very much for all the work that you've done. It's greatly appreciated. It's physicians like you that have really led us to do the research that we do. So thank you. All right. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk podcast with Dr. Kurt Wohler. For more information about this podcast, go to functionalmedicinedoctalk.com.